Okay, folks. Well, thanks for joining in our ongoing discussions at a time of pandemic. And as I've said before, it's um, sad that we all can't get together here, but it's good news in a sense that um, a number of our interstate and uh, intrastate uh, members and supporters can get in on these discussions. So uh, today we're discussing revisiting Australian Federation, and we've got two speakers, William Oliver Coleman and Michael Sexton. I'll introduce them briefly on the occasion of the publication of William Oliver Coleman's Their Fiery Cross of Union, a retelling of the creation of the Australian Federation, 1889 to 1914. Um, William is a reader in economics at the Australian National University, and he's the author of eight books. Now, William's gonna speak for about 20 minutes, and we're gonna follow up with Michael Sexton, who's spoken here on a number of occasions before. Michael has law degrees from the Melbourne University and from Virginia University. He's been an academic lawyer. He's a writer, a barrister in the, 18, in the 1980s. He took silk in the 1990s and is currently solicitor general for New South Wales. And Michael is the author of among his 10 books, his most recent book, Dissenting Opinions by Michael Sexton, which is a collection of his, of his essays on a wide range of topics. Um, so he's going to follow up and we'll have books for sale, signed books for sale after this function concludes. So let's start off with uh, William, then we go to Michael, and then we go to questions and discussion. And remember everyone, we're on the record. William. Well, thank you much. Thanks very much, Jared. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to share with fellow Institute members some ideas about Federation and to do so despite the disarray caused by COVID. The chaos of COVID has renewed attention to Australia's federal structure and has provoked various summary censures and instant solutions. Any worthwhile reconsideration of Australia's federal nature would surely review the history of the Federation, especially its original formation. But such a review might seem unnecessary. Is not, research, is not Federation the most researched event in Australian political history? The writing of that history began even before the year 1901 had closed with the publication of the annotated constitution of the Australian Commonwealth by John Quick and Robert Garrett. And the writing continued over the decades with fluctuations to surge simultaneously with the Centenary Federation in 2001, culminating, one might say, with John Hurst's The Sentimental Nation, the making of the Australian Commonwealth. And yet this history, for all its bulk, remains, I believe, incomplete and lopsided on account of its what I call affirmative premises. In the near universal assumptions of this history, the Federation of 1901 was virtuous in provenance, begotten by commendable ideals of our better selves, patriotism, brotherhood, equality. It was led by remarkable men and it was pursued to its consummation by democratic process. And it was for the good in its effects, fitting, functional, almost inevitable, certainly a mark of progress. It's from these sunny premises of affirmative history that I must dissent. It is my belief that the Federation cause of the six Australian colonies initiated by Henry Parks was tainted in providence, mediocre in leadership, sometimes undemocratic in its processes, botched in its execution, premature in its advent, and damaging in certain enduring consequences. When I say tainted in its providence, I mean that the great motive of federation, I believe, was the hunger of a small bourgeois elite for a grander stage to exercise their thwarted ambitions upon. And I think this is palpable with the likes of Barton, Deakin and Griffin, you know, the three um, leaders of the federation cause. To this banal hunt for power and glory, a second impetus was added by the resentful impulse of regional Australia to punish the neglectful state capitals by demoting them by means of federation. A third animator of the federal course, that the next most important animator of the federal course, rather was a rather facile hopefulness in federation as an opportunity which would serve every particular cause. As one diarist of the day, Riley recorded, federation is to do for everybody what they most wish. When I say it was leadership, it's, it was mediocre in leadership, I will observe that at the pinnacle of that leadership stood Edmund Barton. And I have to venture that he was a commonplace figure, indeed I'm tempted to say a near trivial one. Granted, Barton is the least impressive of the Federationists to the front rank. 
but I'm not overawed by a comparison of the front rank of federationists with that of their leading components, opponents. I find more honorable metal in John Robertson, more elevation in Rose Scott, more true valor in John Hayes than in any federationist of comparable prominence. And when I say the thing was botched, I speak not so much of the blotting of the constitution with certain follies, quirks and crudities, but more fundamental design flaws, such as the muddying of who the executive is responsible to. Is it the House of Representatives or is it the Senate or is it both? And secondly, it's a creation of a powerful high court while laying down almost nothing about the process or conditions of appointment to that court. And when I say it's under democratic, I could easily speak for an hour or more on that. But to illustrate my thought, I think it's characteristic and telling that who was to be first Australia's first prime minister was decided not by parliament. There was no parliament, but by the covert intrigues of a coterie of politicians, a press baron and a colonial secretary. And when I say it was damaging and certain enduring consequences, I am thinking above all else of workplace relations. The Commonwealth Conciliation and Arbitration Act of 1904 disastrously cast the mould of workplace, Australia, workplace relations in Australia for more than a century permanently, I'm tempted to say, by removing those relations from the workplace and instead in locking them in politicised tribunals. Such are the harsh judgments of my recently published book, The Fiery Cross of Union, um, propagates and tries to justify. So what this book, Their Fiery Cross of Union, does is something quite new. It supplies a revisionist history of the creation of the Commonwealth. And it might be said to be revisionist under five heads. Firstly, it spends its time shooting down some myths. The Australian flag, as we know it, was chosen by a competition of the public. The truth is it was chosen by the colonial office. Australia before 1901 was divided by colonial tariffs. The truth is the tariffs of the four largest colonies on each other and on Australian produce were minor and in New South Wales were verging on zero, literally. The celebrated quarrel of May 1900 over appeals from the High Court to the Privy Council was a dispute between patriots on one side and imperialists on the other. In reality, that quarrel was a dispute between Australians and Australians. It tore the country in two. The federal cause was an expression of Australian feeling. I would have to say that there was little feeling for Australia as it was amongst federationists. And to the extent there was an Australianism in the cause, it was an undertow to the main current of the federation court, federationist cause, which was distinctly imperialist. Thus, on the 9th of May 1901, the day of the opening of the new Commonwealth Parliament, it was a Union Jack and no other flag which was hoisted in hundreds of schoolyards across Australia. I might finally mention one myth which no serious historian would dare to go near, and yet retains a remarkable currency, that Federation 1901 was somehow constituted Australia's independence. Legally, effectively, and palpably, the new Commonwealth of Australia was a British colony. Just as it debunks a few myths, it also restores a few things which have been disdained. So federationist history dismisses the Federal Council of Australasia as a faintly ludicrous body. In truth, it was a legislature whose legislation served both justice and utility. Federation history applies a similar scornful disregard to Australia's armed forces before Federation, before 1901. In truth, all three, I think it was three Victoria Crosses, one in the Boer War, won by colonial and state forces, not by the Commonwealth forces. And I believe every shot fired in anger was also fired by those much despised colonial forces. Thirdly, it, Fiery Cross tells the untold. Fiery Cross explores for the first time, to my knowledge, the significance, the existence of significant ballot fraud in the referendums of the late 1890s and 1900 facilitated by the remarkable absence of scrutineers in New South Wales at its two referendums. Now that fraud was not large enough to reverse any outcome of those referendums, and yet it remains tarnishing. The greatest fraud seems to have taken place at Coral, the location of the Coral Conference, of course, a much touted milestone in Federationist history. Fourthly, Fiery Cross highlights the strangely overlooked the eruption of the Labour Party 
after 1901 is an oddly absent chapter from Federation's history. Labor had been winning seats in New South Wales, Queensland and South Australia for 10 years, well established in those parliaments, but without any upward trend. Come 1901, the political transformation. Finally, well, not quite finally, Fiery Cross gives more space to both chance and continuity. It seems unlikely that Federation would have come to pass in the form it did in 1901, if a few months, a year or two before in September 1898, the Premier of Queensland, TJ Burns, had not died of measles at the age of 37. And with respect to continuity, rather than inaugurate some bright new day of union and cooperation, Federation simply intensified a quasi-federal style of government in Australia, which had already been well established by the 1880s. The final dimension of, of um, revisionism is that the book censures certain events which haven't been ignored, haven't been untold, and haven't been mythified, and yet, to my mind, have received a rather easy pass from forbearing historians, such as the disenfranchisement of Aboriginals by the Commonwealth Franchise Act of 1902. The arbitrary and unjust, and in many cases brutal and cruel, deportation of Kanakas, Kanakas by the Pacific Island Labourers Act of 1901, and the replacement of voluntarism as the basis of Australia's defence forces by compulsion, culminating in the boy conscription or universal military training as it was known in the 1909 Defence Act. But perhaps the greatest act of forbearance of affirmative history is that it gives the extraordinary appointments by the Barton Cabinet of two of its own members to the High Court there to sit in judgments of appeals respecting their own legislation. A similar forbearance, I think, is also granted to the subsequent round of appointments to the court, which passed over the scholars, Inglis Clark, John Quick, Harrison Moore, who had written literally great tomes on Australian constitution and chose instead Isaac Isaacs and H.B. Higgins. The first who had been publicly and persistently doubtful of the federal cause, and the second, Higgins, had been scornfully, furiously scornful of the constitution he was now meant to uphold in the High Court. Well, does this setting the record straight about something which happened 120 years ago spell anything for us today? Well, I think it, it does under, under three heads. Firstly, I think it'll improve history more generally. We are yet to have a true modern, put it that way, biography of Edmund Barton. Certainly, Geoffrey Bolton's Edmund Barton of the year 2000 is modern. It is expert. It is also, as I put it, in Fiery Cross charitable. I could have reasonably written lenient. I could have written indulgent. For whatever action the deeply flawed Barton takes, it seems Bolton affords him the most generous interpretation available. This is not necessarily an admissible way of proceeding, but it does make Bolton's book comparable to the official lives, which were once written of British monarchs. That is to say, it is eulogical, pertaining to a eulogy, and eulogy is not biography. More generally, I would say Federation is applied to Australia's past, a kind of carnival mirror, which is exaggerated out of all proportions, some parts of it, the subject, namely the federal parts, while miniaturizing others. Thus, William Macmillan, a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, and a perfect political featherweight has a biography, while John Robinson, five-time Premier of New South Wales, has none. The second way in which I think Fiery Cross might sort of spell, or its thoughts might spell something for us today, is if I'd encourage us to think more critically, and say rationally, about Australia's central government, the Commonwealth. I would say that the first article of Australia's civic religion is the beneficence of federation, and the Commonwealth of Australia is the primary object of devotion of that um, civic religion. And while much is prayerfully implored of that object of devotion, it's not very frequently held to any strict account. I think Australians should think more demandingly of her central government, and they should expect something of, they should expect it to be functional. But functionality was very much an afterthought in the creation of the Australian Commonwealth. Let's consider the transfer of postal services from the colonies or states to the Commonwealth. Certain federationists, those of the second rank, panned this proposal as an absurdity. Barton's public and explicit defense of it was that this transfer was required in order for the Commonwealth 
they have something to do. So truly, the Commonwealth was created, and then its creators looked around for something for it to do. Well, the post office, I might add, parenthetically was transferred with significant dysfunctional effect for the post office, its workers custom and customers. In general terms, the Commonwealth was originally created as a terrain for dominant personalities to express their dominance. And while obviously since then, the Commonwealth has picked up useful roles, particularly since the second decade of the 20th century, defense and foreign affairs, I believe its original purpose still gives it an aggrandizing and therefore pretty much functionless bent. The third reason why I think this book spells something for us today is that I believe that we're the same country to some extent. In looking at federation, we are holding up a mirror to ourselves and seeing ourselves. I see, in seeing federation, I see in ourselves, I'm afraid, a shallowness of Australian feeling. Do we not see that today? In a partition of Australia, which may have its purposes, but the partition of Australia due to COVID and underlined by this appalling sort of spitballing of premiers of one another, right? You know, 120 years of making a nation, and this is what we get. The second thing I see in Federation, which I see in ourselves today, is the weakness of ideas in public council. The thinness of thought in Australia's constitutional convention is dismaying, but very familiar to us. Thirdly, the peculiar prominence of the professions in Australian life. It was certainly exemplified by the ascendancy and federation, of lawyers, civil servants, soldiers, clerics, and doctors. Fourthly, the preeminence of the ritualistic, the legalistic, and the bureaucratic. And finally, the mechanicality of our conception of democracy. Democracy in Australia today is proceeding to a box and putting, putting in a ballot and then counting them all up after 6 p.m. The same mechanical understanding of democracy prevailed in federation and yielded an absurd voting system for the constitutional convention, which produced a convention that was unrepresentative of the voters' wishes. That very same absurd system was used in the Senate to elect the Senate for maybe 17 years, and then it was modified a bit, used for another 30 years, and then Hare Clark in the late 40s was introduced. And we know that same system had elected the Senate in 2013, a member of the Australian Motorist Enthusiastic, Enthusiast Party with, with one half a percent of the vote. Well, at least he got half a percent. Was it 12 members of that Senate, the one which sat between 1213 and 1216? Um, was it 12 who sat and legislated with no votes at all? An obvious gross offence to the spirit of democracy, sanctioned only by the awkwardness of the hair class system Clark system in dealing with resignations and deaths. I'd like to conclude with a thought that may have occurred and may have unsettled some Sydney Institute members. Is the critique which Fiery Cross advances of Australia's history and its implicit its Commonwealth, is that just another piece of cultural destruction? Is it not the case that this thing called the Commonwealth has knitted the inhabitants of the Australian land mess together in some degree to a state of common consciousness, if you like, made a nation? And does that not have a value, independent and disregarding, notwithstanding any dubious origins it may have had 120, 130 years ago? Pursuing this line of thinking, someone might suggest is there not an unnerving parallel between the revisionism of Fiery Cross and the surely preposterous revisionisms presently current in dealing with other subjects in Australia and the United States? Well, in response to that sort of uneasy query, I would suggest that revisionism, like most things, can be used or abused. It can be deployed to good effect or to ill. Certainly revisionism, can constitute either intellectual progress or intellectual regression. Which of those two it is lies in the balance of the novel truths it reveals over the novel falsehoods it introduces. I maintain that that balance is positive for Fiery Cross and is sharply negative for other forms of revision current. That's my contention. I guess it's others to judge, 
but that is my contention. I grant similarly that revision might contribute to welfare more generally or detract from it. I allow that to the extent that the revision is damages some useful myth, it is damaging, regardless of how debunkable those myths may be. I grant that the myth of the Australian nation might be useful, probably was, but I would suggest that the myth of the Australian nation is pretty much dead. By contrast, I have to say, the myth of the Commonwealth is vital and robust. And further, and importantly, I would suggest that the myth of the Commonwealth is no longer an ally of the myth of the Australian nation. In fact, it's now an adversary. See, for example, the travesty of Australian history, which is presented to any member of the public who elects to take the officially sanctioned tour of the Australian, of the Australian Parliament House. So, to summarise, in 2021, in Australia, we have a state, I mean, by that the Commonwealth, a sovereign state without a nation. So not a sentimental nation, but a sentimental state. This is not necessarily a catastrophe. Historically, most sovereign states have been without a nation. But I would say that sentiment about a nation is very probably natural to some degree and it is very possibly useful in many circumstances. But sentiment about a state, I think, is unnatural and ludicrous. And the ludicrous can be tragic. It can be abhorrent. I suggest that the inhabitants of Australia would be better off if they were less sentimental about the state, the Commonwealth of Australia, but instead treated it as a hopefully useful means to certain useful ends. Many thank you. Uh, many thanks, William. And so we go to Michael, Michael Sexton. Thanks, Jared. Um, well, there's no doubt that uh, William's book presents a challenge to the rather anodyne accounts of federation that some of us recall from our uh, school days. One of the most striking features which the book brings out is that there was no wave of popular enthusiasm for the joining together of the colonies into a nation. And this is illustrated by the fact that, as William points out, that in none of the colonies, the number of votes in favour of federation amount to anything like a majority of the adult population. And it's interesting that those who orchestrated federation wanted to get some kind of popular mandate for their proposals. Uh, given that this was not the case, for example, in Canada, about which I'll have something to say shortly. As the book points out, a relatively small group from the professional classes, many of them lawyers, dominated the conventions and produced the Australian Constitution. At the Australasian Federal Convention of 1897, Six of the 10 delegates from New South Wales were lawyers, and so were six of the Victorian delegates, and four of those 12 lawyers would later, later be appointed to the newly established High Court. As someone who has appeared regularly before the High Court over the last 20 years, I can certainly testify to the truth of, Ali, of Alfred Deakin's comment that federalism is legalism. One thing that the founders, except perhaps for Deacon himself, did not foresee was that the court would inexorably expand the powers of the Commonwealth, including the financial role of the federal government, so that there would come to be a serious imbalance in Australia's federal system. It might equally be said, of course, that they would never have foreseen a global pandemic that allowed the states to operate uh, as independent entities, as if in the days before Federation. Nevertheless, it might be expected that once the pandemic has uh, receded, that the dominant role of the Commonwealth uh, will resume and in all probability continue to increase over the coming years. As I've already suggested, the High Court's been an extremely important factor in how the country's federal system has developed, and I'm reminded the remark of Henry Bourne Higgins, quoted in William's book, that in America and Australia, the parliament, 
and the people are kept within the prison walls of the constitution and the high court keeps the key. One of the other things that the founders did not, of course, foresee was the role of the Senate, about which Williams already had something to say. To quote Deacon again, he said that to introduce an American Senate into a British constitution is to destroy both. If the founders thought that the Senate would be a house to protect the rights of the states, they were soon disabused of this as it became a place dominated by political parties. Up until the 1950s, this didn't matter so much because the government of the day could and usually did have a majority in the Senate as well as in the House of Representatives. But the failure of the 1960 referendum designed to break the nexus between, required by the constitution between the numbers in the two houses, section 24 of the constitution requires the Senate to be half the size of the House of Representatives. That led to a significant increase in the number of senators once the House of Representatives was enlarged. This in turn led to the election of independents and members of minor parties, particularly from the less populated states where some senators can be elected with a relatively small number of votes. So it's now almost impossible for the government of the day to obtain a majority in the Senate. The implementation of its legislative program requires endless negotiations with individuals or groups whose focus is often very narrowly based and takes no account of broader national questions. Uh, as the book notes, there was no real spirit of nationalism that drove the colonies towards federation. Apart from the Irish element in the community, the populations of the colonies saw themselves as essentially British and part of the empire rather than as potential Australians. The intensity of this feeling, at least in comparison to the US and to Canada, might be a subject for speculation, but may be explained by the dominance of the British Isles as the source of those coming to the Australian colonies up to that time. This intensity was still evident in 1914 and reflected Australia's contribution to the Great War although even many Irish Australians enlisted in the armed forces. In many ways, it was the war rather than federation that gave Australians their first sense of nationhood. But even then, it was largely a vicarious nationalism with the main identification being with Britain and the empire. To some extent, this has occurred earlier and on a smaller scale in the form of the Boer War, which largely uh, coincided with federation. Australia's federation had little in common, of course, with the coming together of the 13 original colonies to form the United States in 1777. This is hardly surprising since American unity emerged from the need to provide a military response to Britain's resistance to their declaration of independence. The US Constitution was not drafted until 1987 and came into force in, in 1787 and came into force in 1789. Although there were some differences between the Australian colonies, they were relatively homogenous in comparison with their US counterparts, particularly given the great division of the US between the slave and non-slave states, division that would lead after 70 years to a civil war that resulted in more than 600,000 dead. Even now, the economic and social differences between various regions in the US are much more pronounced than any such differences in the Australian community. There are some similarities between the Canadian Confederation of 1867 and Australia's Federation. One difference, of course, is that a number of the Canadian provinces did not formally exist in 1867 and joined the initial group in later stages. This was of course also true with the states of the US. Uh, it's also true that a possibility, at least in the minds of some Canadians, 
of invasion by the US was an external threat, encouraging unity in a way that was not true in the Australian colonies. Uh, another seeming major difference was that there was no popular vote of any kind in the relevant Canadian provinces in contrast to the referendums, however inadequate, prior to the Australian Federation. But the similarity with Canada is uh, that the, Can the Canadian Federation was engineered by a relatively small group of politicians and lawyers. Uh, they organised two major conferences and then travelled to London in 1866 to draft the British North America Act. When these 16 delegates had completed their drafting, the legislation was quite quickly approved by the House of Commons, the House of Lords, with 1 July 1867 being set as the date for union. All, one might think, a rather more orderly process than that which led to Australia's Federation. Uh, perhaps I should stop there and we can have time for, uh, for questions. Many thanks, Michael, and also to William, both of whom are, have made appearances here before, of course, and it's great to have them back. So we come to questions and discussion. Um, as I indicated before, um, we've got copies of Their Fire Across of Union by uh, William and dissenting opinions by Michael. So we come to question and discussion. Uh, you got a note earlier today about using the hand function or if a necessary wave to the camera or whatever. And um, off we go. So we'll start with Anne. Anne? Uh, right. Um, thanks, um, William and, and Michael. And I think it's great that we have a challenging view to what is regarded as, you know, gospel. But I, I, I reflect that whether revolutionary or evolutionary, all, all um, institutions formed for representative government have inevitably begun with an elite, even though there may have been an uprising of the so-called ordinary people. Elites have controlled all the formation and what goes. And, and Robert Menzies was a great believer in the Federation and the constitution and constitutional law and saw the imperfections and the tensions between the states and the federal government is that actual plus. And I'm wondering if you might reflect, uh, both of you, on the fact that it's the imperfection or the lack of perfection of our system that actually has meant it's been a growing organism. And as Michael uh, just said, uh, has changed remarkably from what it was in 1902. Um, can you comment on that as being probably our strength rather than our weakness? Um, well, it certainly has changed, but uh, the question how has it has changed? It hasn't, it hasn't really changed. Through, obviously, there have been successful referendums, but you know, as notoriously, there haven't been many successful referendums, even when you think it would be obviously a sensible idea, such as coordinating the terms of, of senators with members of, of the House of Representatives. Instead, the great change has typically come through the High Court, and um, look, I'm not going to advance an opinion whether that was sort of good or bad, but I, I would rather see constitutional change coming from much more democratic, if you like, um, from, from more sources from the, rather than just up on high, the, um, the high court. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, well, I, I agree, of course, with, with Anne that... Uh, that um, all man-made systems are imperfect. And uh, that, that, and of course, the problem with, with one problem with all federations, including the, uh, the Canadian and, and the US models, um, is the degree of, um, of legalism um, that, you, that, you, that you have with those kinds of models. Um, I, I said that there was an imbalance in the Australian Federation and, and that, as William points out, has really come about through through decisions of the of of, of, of the High Court, um, and I mean to, to just to take an example. I mean there is a very large uh, Commonwealth bureaucracy in the field of, of education, even though the the Commonwealth has no uh, formal power 
in that area. Now that's been brought about by uh, through financial power, through the, the fact that it that that it, it funds um, universities and now, of course, provides substantial fundings in all areas of of, of education. Um, now I'm not suggesting that there's any um, um, ideal solution to that, but I think that there would, as I say, that, that there's a place in the Australian Federation, I think, for a, uh, for a more realistic uh, separate the, the division of, of, of the powers. And that, for example, that's an area, education, which uh, where, where the Commonwealth uh, doesn't have to necessarily participate. But uh, one would only imagine that their participation is simply going to uh, be maintained and increased in the future. Before I go to Graham Bradley, um, to both of you, William and then Marco, well, what, what should have happened in 1901? Something, anything or nothing? Oh, well, <clears throat> counter, counterfactual history is a game we can all play. My own favourite fantasy is um, it failing um, in 1901 and yet 1914, or the years prior to 1914, bringing together an, a, a quasi-federation, um, some sort of federal structure, but one which was the fruit of urgent circumstances, and one, if you like, you can call it ad hoc, but that ad hocness would be a merit. It would have granted the resulting structure brought out of the pressures of 1914 would have, um, would have given a flexibility to, to whatever structure would have resulted, and it would have been more evolutionary and gradualistic rather than this great thunderclap on the 1st of January 1901. Uh, well, I, it's it very, it was, I'm not suggesting it would have been easy, for example, that the Senate's an example for those who uh, uh, organised federation. Um, in the late 1890s to have foreseen, of course, what was going to happen over the course of the, of the next century. Um, but um, if I think less, to, to, to perhaps Lowe Deacon was heavily involved, but less legalism, I think, um, and, and perhaps a more, um, uh, as, as, as William has suggested, a more flexible um, process and, and, a, and a more flexible outcome would have allowed, I think, for, uh, for perhaps some different sorts of developments in the uh, over that next century. Can I add a comment, Jared? Yes, sure. Yeah, look, uh, <clears throat> I think we should be somewhat amazed, really, that the Federation got pulled off in the way that it did, really, when you look at the divisions and the interests of the people at the time. And, and my comment would be, that our, the people who put our federation together were no more flawed than the people who put the United States Constitution together, if you look back at, at their provenance and, and their elitism and so on. And yet that's endured for 100 years longer than ours or more. And, uh, you know, it's been a, a success in, in, in remarkable success in holding together a, a major federal republic. And, and I'm almost amused when people talk about the lack of success in referenda. Uh, you know, a failure of a referendum can be equally success. I mean, the idea of banning the Communist Party, for example, was a bloody bad idea. Uh, and yet it was voted down by the people. And similarly, some people would say the Republic, as presented at least, was a bad idea and was voted down. But they're counted as failures of, of reform rather than perhaps the strengths of the Constitution. William? Uh, I think the question is... Um, not so much whether we regret every outcome of every referendum. Perhaps we applaud the outcome of the Communist Party referendum and the Republic referendum. I think the question is, where has Australia's constitutional development come from? And by and large, with some exceptions, it hasn't come from the referendum. It's come from the High Court, and I think that's an unfortunately top-down um, way of evolving a constitution. There have been other things too, if I could just add to that, William, and things like the referral of powers from the states to give us a United Corporations Act across the country and so on. And those have been extra constitutional, if you like, but they've been pragmatic things and our constitution has allowed those to happen. Um, well, the referral of powers could be discussed 
at great length. In some ways, it seems very casual. Um, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but it, it seems that states can refer almost anything by their own volition. It seems that states can just almost commit suicide by the referral of powers. So what's happened to um, um, the idea that the Constitution is meant to be amended by referenda? But I'm not saying any given referral of powers is not a, um, is, is, is not a, a handy thing to, to have in some form in a Constitution. Michael, do you want to make a contribution there? Yes. Well, just to say that the referral of powers has, has actually been a reasonably successful exercise over over recent decades. I mean, the Corporations Act is one example in the area of um, family law, or, or in terms of um, uh, in terms of relationships that that weren't formalised um, by way of um, by way of marriage. So, and there's there's been another there's been other examples, and so that's actually. Um, worked, I think, reasonably well. That's, of course, done under a provision of the of the Australian Constitution, um, and um, uh, but but of course that it's it's one in which the states, uh, or a particular state, on occasions there's been referrals that haven't been done by all of the states. But but in the case, for example, the Corporations Act, um, that that was done by all of them. Robin Fitzsimons. Robin. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much for those interesting comments. Um, you referred to the excessive legalism in the uh, in the Constitution and in Australia. And as a non-lawyer, uh, I have to say that uh, chimes very strongly. Uh, so my question is, uh, if you were looking at the Constitution again, could you name some specifics? as to ways to avoid this, while at the same time preserving uh, the fundamental right, as a non-lawyer looks at it, of a high court in preserving the rights of minorities, i.e. all of us, uh, against uh, overweening majorities. Um, and would there be a case for a constitutionally limited tenure on, of high court judges, let's say to sev seven years non-renewable, uh, so, and to try and get rid of the political uh, influence on high court appointments, should there be should there be an independent commission on high court appointments uh, composed of including non lawyers? William? Oh well, I'm just, uh, oh, sorry. Who's speaking? Oh, my sorry. Son. My name is Robin Fitzsimons. Yeah, no, yes, yes, Robin. Sorry, Jared. Am I replying now? Yes, I think so. The question is. Yeah. Should we cut down the High Court judges from lifetime appointments to seven years on the trot? Well, I would like to refer to Robin's, um, I think, very surprising suggestion that the High Court um, is somehow by its nature, though she didn't quite, she didn't use that term, but some can be expected to defend minorities. I mean, as an author of a book on federation, I'm well aware that 10,000 persons residing often for many years, sometimes several decades, in perfect legality, um, many of whom were British subjects, were deported um, summarily, we might say, at very short notice. Um, and um, the high, an appeal was taken by one of these unfortunate persons known as Kanakas to the High Court, where sat Barton and O'Connor, Richard O'Connor, two of persons who, of course, drafted and championed the legislation which deported the Kanakas, and of course, they refused the appeal. So I don't see anything in the High Court which necessarily makes it a defender of minorities um, against um, majorities. As for limited terms, um, well, would that make it easier to stack the High Court? Um, that's what I'm a bit anxious about. And remember, like the American Constitution, the Constitution of Australia does not uh, dictate the number of judges to the High Court. Another possibility of stacking. But, but William, you criticised the just a Constitution. Second. Hang on, Graham, just a second. Marco, do you want to make a comment on that? Uh, uh, yes, I'll, I'll just, I'm just going to say that um, in, in response to Robin, that um, it, it's very difficult to avoid um, legalism when you, uh, in, in, in a federal structure, I mean, and that's been true to some extent um, in the United States, of course, and in Canada as well. But as to the notion, the idea of having, a, as it were, a commission that would, 
recommend appointments to the High Court and to a, in, the, in, in the hope of avoiding um, uh, the, the, uh, the activity of politicians in this area. I think the, the problem with that is, and it's perhaps been demonstrated in, in Britain where you do have such a body, that that's largely dominated by past and existing judges. And what you really get is just, a, um, in a sense, an endless um, situation of those persons on the commission choosing people very similar to themselves. I think under the present system, with all its inadequacies, um, that you may still, on occasions, get appointments to the court that are somewhat out of the legal mainstream, which is something that you would never get if you had an appointments commission. Then Michael Bone, then we'll come back to Michael Bradley. Michael Bone. Yes, uh, thanks, Jared. Uh, I want to make one observation in passing before dealing with my main question. And that is that uh, Michael Sexton's point about uh, the link between the, the Senate and the House of Reps. I mean, in effect, there was an unintended consequence of mathematical proportions when uh, the Labor Party, increased, with the support of the Nats, increased the size of the Senate to 12, which was a mathematical disaster uh, because at each half Senate, instead of having five, where you had the capacity for a party to have a majority, three as the two, uh, six all meant uh, it's almost impossible to have a majority. I mean, it's the mathematics that causes the problem. Had the increase been to 14, for example, you would have perhaps restored the mathematical potential, but unfortunately at the same time reduced the quota size. So um, I don't know which uh, would have been the dominant factor. But the point I wanted to make is that the role of centralist the, the centralist propensity of federal governments to seek all ways they can to increase their power as against the uh, states is evident even in governments that uh, like John Howard's that uh, profess strong uh, interest in states rights I mean the use of uh, and abuse of section 92 to uh, increase power, centralist powers, uh, are as mainly as a result of the pressure by governments, by central governments to seek more power. Now, it may well be that uh, the indolence of the electorate, uh, particularly as they're sometimes bored with state governments anyway, uh, is combined with perhaps the increased ability uh, of the central government and its bureaucracies as against uh, the states. And I'm not, as a form of Fed, I'm not necessarily denigrating uh, the states, but the fact is the states generally are the, the service uh, operators rather than the policy operators in general. I know that's an oversimplification, but it seems to me there seems greater intellectual thrust at the center than there is at the peripheries. Well, that be, could be for good or bad, couldn't it? Um, um, depends on the intellectual thrust. Um, but um, look, what I, I, what I would say is, look, this, the Australian ideology is centralism, right? In that there is almost any, no understanding, interest or sympathy in federation as a philosophy of government almost anywhere in Australia. So I'm not surprised, as you point out, that John Howard was, was a government, was, was centralist in spite of its verbalisations to the contrary. Almost every government um, um, has been, and that's just what you'd expect. And in Australia, not in other countries. Why are we not like Canada? Canada is a common country, right? It really, uh, for better or ill, but we are not like that, I think, for ill. But, but uh, Canada has the... the curious situation of Quebecois having a distinctly different set of attitudes. That might be the explanation, granted. Yeah. Michael, do you want to comment on that? Uh, well, I think Michael's quite right to say that, that uh, no matter which party has been in power in Canberra, there's been this uh, uh, accretion of, um, of, of, of power 
in the in the in the central the central government. Um, part of that is uh, perhaps uh, due, of course, to to the to the politicians, uh, but I suspect a lot of it is due to the bureaucracy in Canberra, which is like any institution, um, keen to expand its functions and um, in its empire, and um, uh, and that's certainly been over the last. Um, 25, 30 years, uh, quite quite pronounced um, as between the central government and the states. We go to Anthony and then we go to Mark. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, William and Michael. Thank you very much, Anne and Jared. And I have to say, um, I always find it difficult to follow Bohm, um, um, but thank you, Michael. My question is, just taking the idea of the um, Federation fantasy, uh, a more organic and perhaps better model that might have occurred before 1914. Thinking about the fantasy, what benefits or in fact disadvantages would we have experienced in the last couple of years in Australia through this pandemic, given, um, uh, between the interactions between the states and the, and the federal government, whether it be through the national cabinet or, uh, or deviations from any agreements through the forums that we've seen. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm not, you're, you're suddenly sort of transitioning to the um, COVID there. Um, I can only say about COVID and federalism is it's almost exposed the make a nation myth, right? Um, we, we quickly disintegrate. Um, so where was the fellow feeling? Um, where, was the, where was the brotherhood? After 120 years of, of of waving the brotherhood flag, is it all? Has it all been proved um, idle? That's, it, it seems to have been exposed as, as, as a bit of a fantasy that Australia remains an archipelago of six countries, six six islands. Um, that would be my first um, reaction. But um, uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, that, that would be my response. I don't know whether others have. have May I ask a supplementary, Jared? And yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. The, um, the quite excellent point was made earlier that the defeat of some referenda should be regarded as a success. I'm just wondering whether we had a different system, whether um, a lot of the arguments would have been fought out in courts between the federal and state governments about who was doing what uh, while people were dying of COVID. Um, rather than kind of getting on with it, whether by agreement or by going your own way. Thank you. Well, I, I'm not sure what the Commonwealth Government has added to um, the, the management of COVID, because it, it, it does seem that the Commonwealth Government is sort of redundant, largely, to uh, policy um, thus, thus far. That's sort of going your own way. I think the Commonwealth has obvious uses. I mean, obviously, foreign affairs, obviously, defence is served by a continental government. But it just seems that with COVID, um, it's a different sort of problem where the Commonwealth has been a bit redundant. Well, do you want to make a comment? Otherwise, we go to... Uh... Um, I, will, I will just say that, uh, I mean, arguably, the Commonwealth could have overridden a lot of the actions of the states over the last 18 months in terms of terms of public health measures and border closures. It chose not to, uh, to try to do that. And part of that is because we have such a short electoral cycle. I think in Australia at the federal level, um, we have three year parliaments and after two years, I mean, everyone is already talking about the next, the next election and the Commonwealth has therefore, in this instance, not wanted to take on the states for, I think, for, um, for reasons of, uh, for, for political reasons. But um, it's one of the things that hasn't been much discussed over the last year and a half that the Commonwealth's, Commonwealth's powers uh, haven't been exercised where arguably they might have been. Okay, so I think we're pretty well right on time. So final comment, uh, Mark. Mark? Yeah, sorry, Jared. Um, thanks very much. I, I don't want to um, diminish in any way the erudition and the hard work that's gone into the sophisticated arguments that both William and Michael have presented. But isn't it all a debate about money? Isn't it really, when it comes to the crunch, um, an assessment of the current federation in relation to COVID or any of the iterations that people have looked at in the intervening periods, um, the influence of funds and the flows of funds have determined where the power sits um, and who gets to exercise it? 
Well, I think it just begs the question of those flows of funds. I mean, the, the Constitution never dreamt, the, the makers of the Constitution never dreamt that this new thing called income tax, only just introduced but by New South Wales and Victoria and South Australia, would be monopolised by the Commonwealth government. Okay, they would never dream that a high court in its decision, I think, in 1942, would underline such annexation. So when you raise the whole issue of where's the money coming from, it's coming from the Commonwealth, it's coming from Canberra, but that begs the question, how is it that Canberra managed to annex all these sources of revenue in what seems to be an oddly counter-constitutional way? Uh uh, it's quite right, I think, to say that it normally is about money, and I think you tried to make the point that uh, that it was the financial power of the Commonwealth uh, that had really uh, determined the way in which federalism, federalism has developed in Australia. But just to reiterate the point that I think I made just a couple of minutes ago, oddly enough, the last 18 months in terms of the, in terms of the pandemic, it hasn't been about money, um, and that's perhaps why the states have had um, the sort of role that they've had, although, as I say again, it hasn't, that role hasn't been challenged by the Commonwealth in circumstances where it might have been. Final point. Um, the states could have tried hard and maybe succeeded in getting back their income taxing power, but the general view is they didn't want to because it was easy for the Commonwealth to raise the money and for the states to criticise the fact they weren't getting enough funds. I mean, that was certainly... The policy of Playford when he was leader in South Australia, as Bert Kelly and others have pointed out, and there's never been a great desire, I think, to get back the taxing funds. But what we've seen in recent times, the state's got enormous power without income tax. So to what extent did the states ever try and get their powers back? Well, that's a historical question, but I believe you're right. The states have never had any aspiration to. And for, as you say, it brings responsibility. It brings un unpopularity. But then that just comes back to my thought that you know Australia's ideology is centralism right there is just no sentiment or philosophy or interest or understanding or attraction to any sort of federal model in this country. Cool. Uh, the states have the power to levy income tax but um, for political reasons they've chosen not to and I suppose uh, one of the general problems in, in, in Australia is that uh, that 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 all governments um, have been very reluctant to um, uh, to have to have taxes um, of almost any kind, and um, at one of the problems, of course, of the of the federal budget um, in, in 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 present times, and it's also just not um, not not the states, the um, the federal government as well. I mean, has been re very reluctant to do anything about the GST, which would be the most sensible way of trying to uh, deal with some of the, the problems of tax in Australia. So um, this is a political problem, not an economic problem. Um, we could go on, but we always have a rule of finishing on time and it's right on time. So many thanks for quite a stimulating discussion by both of you and those in on the in on the call. I, I certainly learned a lot tonight and much more about Australian Federation than I'd sort of thought about before because the concept has been challenged tonight or queried tonight, whereas in the past the histories have been pretty sympathetic to Federation and how it developed. But for tonight, thank you. As we've got, we'll have signed copies of William Coleman's book, Their Fiery Cross of Union and Michael Sexton's dissenting opinions. We heard some of those dissenting opinions tonight, but every uh, every now and then, I think he's in the majority. So, but for tonight, uh, many thanks, and uh, we'll see you all again soon.